welcome one of the, wouldn't call him the grand old man, the Count of Jihad, as you can see, 30,000. Uh, it's very good, and I can only recommend it you from time to time look into that. This is where it's at, uh, this is where the, the real information is distributed. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Robert uh, is an old friend of mine. He is a um, tested fighter uh, for truth and justice and freedom. He's also the author of several best-selling books. Um, and uh, let me mention the politically incorrect, <coughs> politically incorrect guide to Islam and the Crusades. The release in peace, and this latest book is called Stealth Jihad, which came out, I think, in November last year. Robert is now working on a new book, uh, uh, in, an interpretation, I think, of the Quran. So, um, I'm very much looking forward to this. We've looked for a long time to have Robert in Copenhagen. I'm so happy we can have him here. Without further ado, let me introduce Robert Spencer. Thank you, thank you, Lars, for the over generous introduction, and thank you all for coming and packing the room here. It's an honor for me to be here to speak to you this evening and to be in this beautiful city for the very first time. Uh, I walked around it uh, quite a bit this afternoon, and it's one of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen. And, uh, thank you for welcoming me here. I was asked to speak tonight about. Uh, the Crusades and about Al-Andalus, and that means that really the, the subject of the evening is particularly the manipulation of the historical record for to suit a modern political agenda, to serve a modern political agenda. And the way that that has been done in connection with the Crusades and the uh, record of Muslim Spain is an extraordinarily illuminating and instructive lesson in the tactics of the Islamic jihadists today. As I hope we are all well aware, those tactics are by no means limited to terrorism or to violent attacks, but there is a multi-pronged front that is designed to erode our cultural confidence and to confuse people to the extent that they are unable or unwilling to fight back against the cultural and societal challenge that the Islamic Jihad represents. Now, this is something, this is a tactic of warfare that has been noted, of course, for a very long time and is the subject, for example, of George Orwell's monumental study of totalitarianism, 1984, and yet it doesn't seem to have registered with virtually any Western analysts of the Jihad as to exactly how this is being done today and to what extent and in such a thoroughgoing manner it is being done. The uh, Crusades, of course, are the cause of all our troubles. Bill Clinton told us this right after September 11th, 2001. And you know he's an unimpeachable source. Bill Clinton said that the Crusaders, rapacious proto-imperialists, swept out of Western Europe, unprovoked, unannounced, and descended upon the Middle East, sowing destruction, savagery, bloodshed, wherever they went. And this has led, he said, to distrust that has lingered between the West and the Islamic world and which he was actually saying manifested itself in the attack on September 11th. In other words, the September 11th attack, as far as Mr. Clinton was concerned, was all the Crusaders' fault. And this is a very common theme. It is not only Clinton who has said this, not by any means. The idea is very deeply ingrained. There's a book, uh, the, the Crusades Through Arab Eyes by Amin Malouf, which is very illuminating. And the scholar himself, who put it together, Mr. Malouf, says the same thing. That there was essentially peace and harmony 
between the Western world and the Islamic world until the Crusaders gave into the barbarism, savagery, and imperialism that we all know is intrinsic in the Western character and invaded the Middle East. Now, of course, there are several problems with this. The first problem is that it isn't true. <laughs> the, 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 crusade, the first crusade was called in 1095. I'll return to this. But the first crusade was called in the year 1095. And the crusaders arrived in Jerusalem in 1099. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, died in 632. And by 642, his armies had invaded and conquered Syria, Palestine, and Egypt and continued going and conquered in rapid succession North Africa, up through Spain, into France, as well as besieging Constantinople by 711 and sweeping over Persia and into India, all by the 8th century, all within 100 years of Muhammad's death. They had carried out a record of conquest unparalleled in human history. And it was all done for religious reasons that were delineated by the same prophet of Islam in the holy book that he left for the Muslims and in traditions that recorded his words and deeds which are considered normative for Muslims. So, all that was hundreds of years before there was ever any crusade. And yet, we are to believe that all the hostility between the West and the Islamic world comes from the crusades. Obviously, the points of the, the point of this there are several goals designed to be put forth in this, by means of this historical myth, to blunt the impact of the violence committed in the name of Islam that we see today. Because after all, Christianity and Christians are just as bad, and look what they did. And to disarm resistance to Islamization, resistance to the Islamization of Europe, resistance to Islamization anywhere, by sapping our own cultural self-confidence and peddling a moral equivalence that would make us believe, and has made many people believe, including Mr. Clinton, but not limited to him, that there's really no point in resisting this, because after all, nobody's hands are clean, we all have a spotted historical record, and nobody can say their culture is superior to any others, or that a culture is worth defending against a massive full-scale cultural invasion that would be improper, not only racist, but it would be improper in terms of this historical myth. Because why would there be a need to resist when we have acted the same way? And what's more, and this is where Al-Andalus comes in, why would there be a need to resist when under Islamic rule in the past, everything was so wonderful? <laughs> and so that's where we get to Muslim Spain. And this is... Uh, the, the product of primarily a, a scholar named Maria Rosa Menocal in her book, The Ornament of the World, but it is here again by no means limited to her work. We, get the, we are told that in Spain, in the Middle Ages, after the Muslim conquest of the 7th century and the 8th century, the, there was a, a, a proto-multiculturalist paradise in which Jews and Christians and Muslims lived together in harmony and there was a flowering of science, of intellectual endeavor and of artistic achievement. And here again, it's a wonderful story, but it's false and it's deliberately, manipulatively false in order to proffer various political ends. It is to suggest, in other words, several things that Islamic terror is an epiphenomenon, that violence committed in the name of Islam is something that we need not be concerned about because for the most part Muslims have not behaved this way, they've really been just wonderful. And to suggest that there is a large mainstream authoritative and ultimately dominant tradition within Islam that is tolerant, pluralistic, and ultimately fundamentally benign, such that, and this is the subtext, should it happen that a Muslim Spain were revived, or a Muslim France created, or an Islamic Republic of the Netherlands, 
or what have you, then we need not be concerned about that because it will be a wonderful, benign, multiculturalist paradise just like Spain. And so the goals of this are clear. Now, it is worth knowing. Time doesn't permit many details, but it's worth knowing the reality of the record in regard to both. In the first place, when we talk about the Crusades and Jihad, they are not equivalent. They're very often used as equivalents, and there have been many times, as a matter of fact, I've had to fight with editors in America. I have two weekly columns, uh, one in Human Events, which is a newspaper. It was Ronald Reagan's favorite newspaper, if any of you are uh, admirers of Mr. Reagan as I am. Uh, and uh, front page magazine online. And several times, editors have taken what I have written and changed it to refer to an Islamic crusade. Now, that is offensive on a number of levels. For one thing, the Muslims about whom I am writing would find it most offensive, because a crusade, the word itself, is derived from a cross. And as you may know, at the end, in the end times, in Islamic eschatology, at the, the end of the world, Jesus will return. Jesus, the prophet of Islam, and he will break all the crosses. That the Quran says in chapter 4, verse 157, they did not kill or crucify him, who's they, of course, the Jews, who were boasting of having crucified him in the Quranic record. They did not kill or crucify him, but it appeared so unto them. They thought they had crucified him, but actually Allah had performed a deception because he is the best of schemers, as the Quran also tells us, and had fooled them into thinking they had crucified Jesus when actually they had not. So to speak of the cross is intrinsically offensive to Muslims, and to speak of an Islamic crusade is intrinsically offensive to Muslims, but it also ought to be intrinsically offensive to all of us here, and to any European or American, whether or not we are Christian, because there is actually no parallel between violence committed in the name of Islam and violence committed in the name of Christianity. Now understand me well, I am not saying that Muslims have all been evil and Christians have all been good. Christians have done terrible things in history and justified them by means of Christianity. There's no doubt about that and there's no gainsaying that. And that actually is one thing that you will hear Westerners saying because we have a generally healthy tradition of self-criticism. Sometimes it can be unhealthy, I believe but a generally healthy tradition of self-criticism that is absolutely, completely absent in the Islamic world. So you will never hear a Muslim saying, never, never. If you ever do, I will, I will give you a large sum of money. But <laughs> never have I heard in, 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 in years and years of, of, of reading material written by Muslims daily, never have I heard any Muslim ever say, well, certainly Muslims have done wrong in the past, have committed historical evils, never. But in any case, I digress. The reality of the Crusades is that they were, as I alluded to earlier, a defensive action that was actually late, quite delayed, and small scale. At the time of the Islamic Jihads that I mentioned before, that overwhelmed Syria and Egypt and North Africa and Persia and it swept up into Western Europe, occupied Sicily for a time, and went into Italy also. At the time of these invasions and conquests, most of that land was Christendom. It was actually the most important part of Christendom at that time. If you have at, at all looked into the, uh, his, the history of the first millennium of the church, the church's, uh, you could call it sacred geography, was quite different from what it became in the second millennium. There were five patriarchates, five centers of Christianity in terms of centers of Christian theology and Christian liturgical development. And four of them were in what we now know of today as the Islamic world. And only one was not, and that was Rome. Constantinople was the location of the largest and most influential church in Christendom, which is now a mosque, well now a museum, but it is a museum in which Islamic prayer is allowed and Christian prayer is not, the Hagia Sophia. But 
four of the five patriarchates being in the eastern part of the Roman Empire and then being overwhelmed by Islam, what essentially happened was that the theological center, the center of the development of early Christianity, and the liturgical center for Eastern Christianity, and what amounted to over half of Christendom at that time, was overwhelmed and conquered by the Islamic jihadis. And the Christians being riven by schisms and distracted by various other interests did not respond. And 450 years went by. The circumstances of the First Crusade being called are very, very ill-known. In reality, there was no imperialistic invasion. There was no imperialistic intent. There were imperialists. And they did establish kingdoms. But they were actually transgressing against the stated goals and the stated methods that they had agreed to before they left. They were actually departing from what they had promised to do. <clears throat> what they, the reason why the First Crusade was called because the Byzantine Emperor, the Eastern Roman Emperor, Alexius Comnenus, actually appealed to the Pope for help in the latter part of the 11th century because he was seeing, especially after the Battle of Menz occurred in 1078, he was seeing his domains completely overwhelmed and Asia Minor, now known as Turkey, the, the, which was the heart of the Byzantine Empire, was, was, was completely overwhelmed, conquered. Constantinople was endangered. The other great seas of early Christendom, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem had been conquered centuries past. There was no chance of recovering them. Not only was the Byzantine Empire, which even despite the schism between the East and West, which was fresh at that time, it was only 25 years old, and thus was something that people had no idea was going to stretch on for another millennium and see no, no hope of being healed at any time. At that time, it was one in a series, actually, of of, of schisms that had been healed previously. And there was no sense of this great divide between the East and the West, which developed later. In any case, there was the appeal from the Byzantine Emperor. There was also the threatening of the Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land and the Christian residents of the Holy Land who had been there since the time of Christ himself. In the early part of the 11th century, the Caliph al-Hakim who is a fascinating historical figure who later decided he himself was God. Uh, <laughs> before he did that, however, he, uh, he's actually uh, uh, worshipped by the Druze. You, you may have encountered the Druze who have been variously allies of the Israelis, allies of the Lebanese, depending on which Druze you ask. But in any case, the Druze are very secretive about their religion, but it does have to do with this erratic and probably insane caliph who deified himself. But before he did that, he uh, decided that the Christians were all going to have to stop this heretical business because in Islam, in traditional Islam, Christianity is a heretical twisting of the original Islamic message of the prophet Jesus. And so they were going to have to cut this out. And he started to destroy the churches. He destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and had it completely raised, completely obliterated. No stone upon stone, nothing. And destroyed thousands, literally thousands, of churches in the Holy Land at the same time, in the early part of the 11th century. And at that time, there was a more or less steady stream of pilgrims visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and other sites in Jerusalem, as they still do today. And they were increasingly beset by people, by uh, Muslims who, in the name of Islam, would work to subjugate them, would conquer them, would, I mean, I'm sorry, would attack them and uh, often kill them. Now, nothing happened. Nobody did anything about any of this, but it was all going on. And Al-Hakim actually, at the time that he decided that he himself and not Allah was God, he stopped it and he actually ordered the Church of the Holy Sepulchre rebuilt but the Christians were still in very desperate straits in the Holy Land. And so it was out of the appeal from the Byzantine Emperor 
and the condition of the pilgrims in the Holy Land that the Pope called the First Crusade in order to secure the Holy Land for these pilgrimages. Now, as I said before, the Crusaders did some terrible things, and I'm not saying that their record was spotless by any means. One of the first things they did was on their way across Europe was attack Jews, which was not only evil in itself, but it was strategically, ridiculously foolish. The great historian Batya Or has argued in her groundbreaking studies of Dimitu, which is the institutionalized second-class status that Islamic law mandates for non-Muslims under Islamic rule, and there'll be more on that later. Uh, she has argued, quite cogently I believe, that it is imperative at this time for the historical Dimi communities, the communities of those non-Muslims who were subjugated under the rule of Islamic law and will be subjugated again if Islamic rule is established anywhere in the world, it is imperative for them to band together, to ally, to unite, and to fight against this common threat. The Crusaders, perhaps it is anachronistic to expect them to have that kind of perspective, but nonetheless, had they had it, and had they asked the Jews for help as they went across Eastern Europe, and invited them to join them, history might be different in very, very many important ways. And that was a disastrous thing, and it was even worse when they went into Jerusalem and burned the synagogue in which the Jews had taken refuge. There's no excusing that, and there's no discounting that. But these atrocities, and that is what they were, do not change the fact that the Crusades in themselves, as they were called, were not an imperialistic exercise, and were not unprovoked, but were a defensive action on a very small scale. There was no attempt to recover Egypt, well, there was in a later crusade, but it was not even really an attempt to recover Egypt. It was sort of a tactical maneuver into Egypt in order to put pressure on the Holy Land. There was no attempt to recover Syria, no attempt to recover any of the lands that had been conquered. It was only an attempt to secure the Levant. And that's it. Now, the crusades, one may think, one may argue, and I think that it, it's, it is a reasonable argument that can be made, were a perversion of the spirit and the teachings of Christianity and of Christ himself in taking up arms in this way. Christianity in its major branches of Catholicism, of Orthodoxy, and of most of the Protestant sects has never been absolutely strictly pacifistic, but except for the Crusades, except for the 200 year period of the Crusades, has never been so explicitly connected to open warfare either. And so that's something that can be argued, but nonetheless it is a fundamentally different thing from the Islamic Jihad theology. In Islam, in the Quran chapter 9 verse 29, Muslims are told to fight against those who do not believe in Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, which is the Quranic designation primarily for Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya which is a tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now this is an isolated verse, and you can say, and, and, and people say this to me about eight or ten times a day, that uh, I'm taking the verse out of context, cherry-picking verses in my uh, insane uh, hatred and bigotry, and picking out this verse and making much of it, when really the, you can find verses in the Bible that are damaging as well. Yes. The difficulty with that idea, with that claim, that this is one verse taken out of context, is that, well, there's several. One is Muslims have acted upon it throughout Islamic history. Second, all the schools of Islamic jurisprudence, the four major the Sunni schools, the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali schools, as well as the Shiite, Jafari school, and the other Shiite schools. They all teach, not just one of them, but they all teach that it is the responsibility of the Ummah, of the Muslim community worldwide, to wage war against unbelievers and subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law, in which subjugated status they will pay this tax and will accept other various humiliating and discriminatory regulations that ensure that they feel themselves subdued as per the Quranic verse. 
So in other words, we hear many times in America, and I'm sure you've probably heard it here as well, that the uh, uh, aggressive stance and violence toward unbelievers manifested by Osama bin Laden and by others is a twisting and a hijacking or perversion of the true peaceful Islam. Now one would expect that if that were true, one would be able to come up with at least one sect or one school of jurisprudence that actually did teach that Muslims ought to get along with other people and not try to either kill or subjugate them. Can't we, I mean, even just one? But there isn't one. Even the Ahmadiyya, who are widely, or the Sufis, well, the Sufis are another story, but the Ahmadiyya first are a, uh, a, a group that's generally considered heretical. And one of the reasons why they are considered heretical and violently persecuted in Pakistan is because they teach that there's no, no space for violence in jihad. But does that mean they don't teach jihad? Does that mean they don't teach that there ought to be the imposition of Islamic law over the unbelievers such that they are institu set into this status of institutionalized discrimination? No, of course they teach that. They just teach it ought to be done by different methods. That's all. And so, <coughs> pardon me if I don't find that comforting. <laughs> The Sufis also are widely reputed to uh, be peaceful when there is absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. The Sufis are mystical. That's not the same thing. To, to, to devote one's life to prayer and so on does not necessarily mean that one does not wish to take up arms. If you read Al-Ghazali, who was the, the founding, the titanic uh, thinker for the Sufis, he is very clear about the responsibility that Muslims have to fight the infidels and to kill them or to bring them into the rule of the Muslims. And the Sufis have been at the forefront for centuries of the jihad against the Russians in the Caucasus that is centered in Chechnya. And not only that, but uh, Hassan al-Banna, who was the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an international Islamic organization that is dedicated in its own words, and I quote, from an internal Brotherhood document that was uh, captured by law enforcement in the United States and released last year. The brothers must understand that their work in America, and I expect this goes for Europe as well, is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is victorious over other religions. The organization that is dedicated to this as a goal was founded in 1928 in Egypt by a gentleman, Hassan al-Banna, Tariq Ramadan's grandfather. And Hassan al-Banna was uh, very, very deeply taken with the Sufis and instituted various Sufi exercises to be required of the early Muslim brothers as part of their daily religious observance. And so, not only that, but Ayatollah Khomeini, with whom I suspect you're, you're, you're familiar, uh, he uh, was also very influenced by Islamic Sufism and wrote some uh, really very fine poetry, I think, mystical poetry, <laughs> uh, if, if you like that sort of thing. And he, uh, he of course, is famous for saying that uh, those, he, I, I spit on the foolish souls who say Islam is a religion of peace. It's his spittle, not mine. He said it. So, the difference ought to be striking that there is no tradition of warfare against, there's no theological school of Christianity, there is no sect of Christianity that teaches that Christians must make war against unbelievers and subjugate them under the rule of Christian law. And there is no such thing as Christian law. Christianity does not offer the kind of comprehensive legal system that regulates every minute aspect of life that Islam offers. And so there is no such in Christianity. The Crusades arose out of various historical circumstances and ended at a certain point, such that you know it would be the most uh, wildly surprising and unexpected thing. I think we can lay odds that it won't happen that the Pope today would call it. And in jihad, in Islam, jihad is central, jihad is martial, jihad is supremacist, and jihad is universal. It's taught by all the sects and schools. 
And so to speak about the problem of the Crusades as if they are the source of the ill will between the West and the Islamic world ought to be clear at this point as obviously nakedly manipulative. Now, Bill Clinton obviously doesn't realize he's not the one manipulating. He is being manipulated by a concerted propaganda effort. Really, Islam is the only religion that has a sophisticated propaganda machine and that has a, a concerted campaign to burnish its image. It's very interesting when you hear Islamic spokesmen talk so often if they are condemning terrorism, as they often do, if they're condemning a specific terror attack, it is very telling. Watch out for this and you'll see it much more often than we ought to. People saying, this is bad for Islam. This is bad for Islam's image. In other words, they don't speak in terms of, this is evil, this is immoral, this is wrong, you're killing human beings. There's no idea of that. It is only bad for Islam's image if it were that the, if, if a situation were to arise in which they didn't need to care about their image, then these things could go on with no trouble. Al Andalus is the same way. The the Dimi laws, the laws of dimitude, are deeply ingrained within Islamic tradition itself. Islamic law is very clear and there's no disagreement or only minor disagreements among the various schools of jurisprudence <laughs> about these things. <clears throat> that the, the dhimmi, the protected person, who's under the protection of the uh, Islamic overlords, mm -hmm. you may recall that uh, the mafia also, they make you pay protection. Mm -hmm. And it's very like that. Because in exchange for your life, in exchange for not being killed, the dhimmi submits, and he does not speak ill of Islam. He does not speak ill of the Prophet. He does not speak ill of Allah. He does not speak ill of the Quran. If he does, the contract of, dim of the Dimma, the Zumma, will be revoked. And his life will be forfeit. So consider that for a moment in light of the freedom of speech wars that we are seeing in the world today. The attempts to silence Kirt Wilders in the Netherlands and in Europe in general and the attempts by the organization of the Islamic Conference to criminalize what it calls Islamophobia. And then when you ask them to define Islamophobia, well, here it is. It is any speech that is critical of Islam, any speech that even speaks honestly about the activities of the global jihadists. As a matter of fact, there is an organization of the Islamic Conference which is the largest voting bloc in the United Nations right now. There's an OIC document that specifically names counter-terror analysis as Islamophobic. <laughs> now why would that be? Obviously because if, if, if someone like <coughs> Lars Hedegaard or Spencer or Wilders, somebody says, well you see, they, they blow themselves up in crowded public places because the Quran says that uh, the paradise is guaranteed to those who kill and are killed for Allah. And if Qaradawi, the, the, the influential, internationally influential sheikh out of Qatar says that, then that's all right. But if I quote him, that's Islamophobia. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a violation of the laws of the, the, the Dimnis. So it is an attempt, this attempt to criminalize free speech, to criminalize speech that is considered critical, even if it's simply report, uh, reporting, even if it's simply accurate. To criminalize these things is to attempt to compel the West to accept this, this element of the Dimi laws. <coughs> and to compel the West to become more pliant and less resistant to the effort in general to impose the rest of his own <coughs> law here. And so Al-Andalus is a place where those laws were in force. So instead of looking at it and imagining that we see a proto-multiculturalist paradise, we should look at what it actually was like. And so I have a little bit of information about that. The uh, Andalusian jurist of the Maliki school, Ibn Abdun, wrote this around 1100 in the Multiculturalist Paradise. No Jew or Christian 
may be allowed to wear the dress of an aristocrat, nor of a jurist, nor of a wealthy individual. On the contrary, they must be detested and avoided. They were, he was mandating that non-Muslims, Jews and Christians, have to wear dress, have to wear clothing that's distinct from those, that of the Muslims. It wasn't Hitler who invented that with the yellow star. He got it from the Muslims, whom he greatly admired, for that matter. <clears throat> and the reason why Ibn Abdin goes on, it is forbidden to greet them with the expression, peace be upon you, assalamu alaikum. A Muslim is forbidden to extend peace to a non-Muslim. And so you can't say the standard Islamic greeting of a Muslim to another Muslim. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalamu. It cannot be done to a non-Muslim. As a matter of fact, <coughs> a Muslim is instructed in Islamic law to return a greeting from a non-Muslim by saying, peace be upon those who are rightly guided. In other words, <laughs> peace be upon the Muslims, not on you, buddy. <laughs> so, this is a small thing, but coming out of uh, the United States, and I was actually born in South Carolina in the uh, southern part of the United States, just as the South was uh, casting off uh, the uh, dark period in, in, in American history of segregation and discrimination that was enforced by just these same kinds of small things. And a black man had to step off the sidewalk if a white man was coming to allow him to pass. And if he didn't, he'd be beaten up or worse. And you know, my grandfather had to step off the sidewalk in the Ottoman Empire to allow a Muslim to pass. It was not at all something that was invented in the American South. I'm not saying that Bull Connor was uh, influenced by Islam. Hitler was, but uh, this, the, the, the connection there was purely coincidental. But the connection was real in terms of the intent was the same, to demean the subjugated class and to make sure that it felt itself subdued, as per the Quran verse. Uh, Ibn Abdin actually goes on to say, Satan has gained possession of them the Jews and Christians, and cause them to forget God's warning. They are the confederates of Satan's party. Satan's confederates will surely be the losers. And so they were made to feel this very, very deeply on a daily basis. Another provision of the laws of dimitude that was in effect in Muslim Spain was that non-Muslims were forbidden to hold authority over Muslims. In Pakistan today, colloquially, the Christians are known as street sweepers. There's a gang of street sweepers over there. Now why would they call them that? <clears throat> because the Christians occupy the most menial jobs in the society. They are forbidden to hold authority over Muslims. They therefore have these menial jobs and are derided for heaven at the same time as if they're not capable of anything else. Now, at the same time, any kind of, any law, any human law, Islamic law, Danish law, any law, is often honored in the breach. And there are periods in which it is enforced, and periods in which there is a lax attitude toward a particular law or set of laws, and it's ignored. And this is no less true in Islamic history, and no less true in Muslim Spain, but this has caused some of the confusion that we see over this, although a lot of it is sown deliberately. In 1066, <clears throat> uh, there were two Jews named to positions of governing authority in Spain, in Granada, and they actually held authority over Muslims. You may have heard of this because it is a centerpiece of tolerant pluralistic Al-Andalus. Jews held positions of power. <laughs> they were treated just like anybody else. Well, it's true. Absolutely true. Uh, Samuel Ibn Nagrela and his son Joseph did indeed occupy positions of power and influence in Granada, whereupon they were assassinated in 1066 for precisely that reason, because they held power over Muslims, and other Muslims found this offensive, and found that the Muslims who had put them into power were transgressing Islamic law, 
and that the Dimbis who had accepted that power had to be punished. There was an extensive pogrom. 5,000 Jews were killed. The Jewish community of Granada was decimated. And it was because of this tolerant, pluralistic, proto-multiculturalist granting of authority over the Muslims. Abu Ishaq, who was a well-known Islamic jurist of the time and at that place, he wrote this, egging on the attackers. Put them back, the Jews, where they belong. Put them back where they belong and reduce them to the lowest of the low. Turn your eyes to the other Muslim countries and you will find the Jews there are outcast dogs. So in other words, what are we doing giving them power here? Do not consider it a breach of faith to kill them. They have violated our covenant with them. They have violated, in other words, they violated the Dimma and a, a, a Jew or Christian who violates the terms of the contract of protection, his life is forfeit. They have violated our covenant with them, so how can you be held guilty against the violators? The Almohads later persecuted the Jewish and Christian populations in Spain for precisely the same reason. They were deemed to have violated the terms of the contract, and thus their lives were forfeit. They were never, in other words, equal citizens with the Muslims. They never enjoyed equality of rights in the society with the Muslims. The, the, the rights they did enjoy, the position they did enjoy, was only at the sufferance of the Muslim rulers and could be revoked by them and was at any time. So Al-Andalus is indeed a model. Al-Andalus is a model of what the Islamic jihadists and their allies see for Europe in the 21st century. That is absolutely the model that they want to implement, and they will implement if they get the chance. And it is not a model of multiculturalist harmony. It is a model of subjugation and the denial of core Western Judeo-Christian principles of the equality of dignity of all people before the law and the equality of rights of all people before the law and the freedom of speech. These things would absolutely be completely destroyed. So, as a tactic, it is a very effective, extraordinarily effective tactic to portray Muslim Spain and also, for that matter, the Ottoman Empire as, as uh, models of tolerance and multiculturalism at a time when Europe is overwhelmed with an immigrant wave that is unlike any other immigrant wave in human history at any time or place. Because the immigrants who are coming into Europe from Muslim countries today have a ready-made model of society and governance, a ready-made system of laws that they bring with them and that they believe to be superior to the model of society and governance and the system of laws of the places to which they are coming. Never before has this happened. And it's happened at precisely the time when the European and American elites have decided that all cultures are essentially equal in value, interchangeable, and really it's a, it's a matter of indifference as to which one may be dominant at when, in, in any particular time and place, and that it is only racism and bigotry that would motivate anyone to resist any immigrant wave. Obviously, this has nothing to do with race at all. There are plenty of people who are exactly the same race as those of the Muslim immigrants. The Hindu immigrants from India have no trouble, have never caused any of the kinds of troubles we've seen from Muslim immigrants, have no trouble assimilating into European societies. The idea of the, of, of the Islamic Jihad or Islamic supremacism as a race is also controverted by the fact of Western converts. In the United States, one of the foremost spokesmen for uh, the uh, Islamic uh, advocacy group, the Council on American Islamic Relations, is a gentleman named Ibrahim Hooper, Douglas Hooper, who uh, is a, uh, actually, I believe he's of Norwegian descent, and he's from Minnesota, and he converted to Islam in the 90s, and is now uh, very prominent 
blonde-haired, blue-eyed spokesman for Islam and for a, 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 an Islamic supremacist group that has demonstrable ties to Hamas. So, is Hooper somehow not a threat to Judeo-Christian civilization or Western civilization because he's a white man? It's, it's a ridiculous idea, really. But it's, it's, here again, a manipulation of the foundations of the debate so as to divert us into issues that are irrelevant and distract us from the main problem. And this is the goal primarily of this historical revisionism as well. There's really nothing to worry about. Anybody who worries about it, it's your problem because you just are, are hateful or racist. And thus, you need to look to yourselves to deal with this. Because even if they do prevail, everything will be okay, just like it was in Spain. And you must be one of the descendant of, of, of those crusaders who <laughs> gratuitously invaded and, and conquered so much of the Islamic world so long ago. And that's just the opposite of the kind of spirit we need in this new multiculturalist age. Now, uh, that's, the, that's the dominant view, is it not? I uh, wish that I could offer you some easy way to dispel that, but this is the fog through which we all must blunder and lurch and make our way through. Uh, the, the only thing I think that we can do is to continue to tell the truth. To tell the truth about these historical issues, to tell the truth about the present situation, and to trust that the truth will prevail, and thereby, in a healthy awareness that we have a culture that's worth defending, and a civilization that's worth defending, while not whitewashing any of the sins of our ancestors, demonstrating that that fact in itself, that we actually do have something worth preserving, and that if we do not preserve it, the night, the darkness that will descend upon Europe and upon America as a result of its descent upon Europe will be far darker and far more horrible than most anyone has envisioned. Thank you very much.